Okay, welcome to the December SWS webinar series. I was just giving it a few minutes so um, people can, can join. Today we're going to hear from Dr. Mark Brown, who will be talking about wetlands ecology and ecological engineering at University of Florida, 40 years of the co-evolution of science and regulation. But first, um, let's recognize our 2021 SWS webinar series sponsors. For those of you who may not be as familiar with our SWS webinar series, our monthly webinars are usually held on the third Thursday of the month at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. As you can see on this listing of our upcoming webinars, we have both our regular SWS webinar series, that's in English, and also we have quarterly webinars offered in Spanish, which are open to members and non-members alike. Our webinars are also posted on YouTube for free viewing, and we have quite the library of over 60 different webinars that are getting a lot of playtime during the pandemic. Another expansion of our program is the development of wetland interviews, so make sure to keep those on your radar. We are proud to recognize our SWS webinar series sponsors for 2021 including HDR, in situ, Wild Note, the Whittington Group, and Delta Land Service. You can find their information at the websites listed above. And please visit, like, and follow our SWS webinar sponsors. Since January 2018, we have gone through the process of having our SWS webinars pre-approved by the SWS Professional Certification Program as being applicable for continuing education credits. Now these credits can be applied to your Professional Wetland Scientist Certification or Renewal or other certifications. We have applied for that pre-approval for this webinar today as well. It seems even more important during the pandemic to gather as many, uh, as many CEUs as you can from online or virtual training sessions like the SWS webinars. Participation certificates for watching the webinar in its entirety are available through an automated process. You will receive an email from our SWS Managing Director, Michelle Chosek, about one day after the webinar. You'll need to check your spam email if you don't see it. These certificates are free to all of our SWS members. Participation certificates are also available for those who watch the webinar recordings on YouTube. Um, you can, which you can find these on our past webinars page on our YouTube channel, complete with multilingual captions. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. The general format for today's webinar will be a 45 minute presentation by our speaker followed by approximately 15 minutes for questions and answers. All attendees, you will be muted for the duration of the webinar. When it comes time for questions, um, your questions, you can type them in the, um, you can share those questions by clicking on the Q&A button um, shown here. So you won't be typing your questions in the chat, okay? It, you'll be typing them in the Q&A the Q&A section. The chat button will be reserved for technical difficulties that will be monitored by SWS staff. At any time during the presentation, you can type your questions into the Q&A button or pane, and participants can upvote questions in the Q&A that they want to be answered earlier. As your moderator, I will pose those questions that I've received in the Q&A pane to the speaker. A survey should pop up at the end of this Zoom meeting. Please fill out that survey to give us feedback about today's webinar and the SWS webinar program. Additionally, please indicate if you'd be interested in giving a future SWS webinar in 2022. So, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce our speaker today. Dr. Mark Brown is an Emeritus Professor of Environmental Engineering 
Sciences and Director of the Center for Environmental Policy at the University of Florida. He is a systems ecologist whose research focuses on systems ecology, wetlands ecology, ecological engineering, and energy analysis. While his early career research focused on wetland ecology and management and ecological engineering, during later phases of his career, his attention turned to applied and theoretical approaches to understanding the energy, ecology, and economics nexus. He was director of the Howard T. Odom Center for Wetlands from 2006 to 2016, and was a past vice president and president of the American Ecological Engineering Society. In 2011, Dr. Brown was distinguished Fulbright Chair of Energy and Environment at Parthenop University of Naples, Italy. And currently he is distinguished visiting professor at Beijing Normal University in China. In 2019, the American Ecological Engineering Society presented him with the Odom Award for Ecological Engineering Excellence. In 2021, Dr. Brown was awarded the Lifetime Achievement Award by the Society of Wetland Scientists. During his 35 years of teaching at the University of Florida, he mentored about 110 masters and PhD students and was awarded Teacher of the Year in 1999 and graduate advisor or mentor of the year in 2006. Without further ado, I'll hand it over to Dr. Brown. Greetings, everyone. <clears throat> it's a pleasure to be here. We had some <laughs> technical difficulties when I started, and hopefully you can hear me, and uh, and, and I can, uh, uh, and you can see me as well. Um, it's a, quite an honor to do this lecture. Let me uh, share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can see my screen. So uh, try to get 40 years of uh, science uh, in 40 minutes is a real tough thing to do. So it's going to be a very broad brush of trying to understand um, this idea of a coevolution of science and regulation. Um, so what's coevolution? It's a socioeconomic systems co-evolving components. Uh, each exist, uh, exert selective pressure on the other, thereby affecting each other's evolution. And so we have what I believe is coevolution in uh, in science and regul regulation and management um, you know, all all the, during the, my entire career. I want to first start with saying that. This whole thing, my career and this whole idea of wetlands and, and uh, ecological engineering started um, about 1970 at the University of Florida when H.T. Odom arrived there. Uh, in addition to his groundbreaking uh, research, he also founded the disciplines of ecological engineering and ecological economics. So 1980, uh, what happened? The Rubik's Cube was uh, debuts. Mount St. Helen erupts, the Iran-Iraq war starts, CNN launches, John Lennon is shot uh, in New York, and Ronald Reagan becomes the 40th president of the United States. And I finish my PhD. I was very fortunate at that point um, to spend the next um, 15, 20 years throughout the state of Florida traipsing through wetlands from uh, the Panhandle uh, to the Everglades. Um, and it was a great education on, um, on ecology and, and uh, hydrology and nutrient dynamics. And, and one of the things that I noticed um, as I was doing all that traipsing, as I was doing all those transects and so forth, um, was that uh, the farther away I got from humans, um, the better the wetlands looked. And the closer I got to humans, in other words, the closer I got to our urban systems um, or uh, big massive agricultural systems, the wetlands that I was um, surveying uh, were in worse shape. And that stuck with me for a long time and I'll come back to that a little later. So how I'm gonna organize this lecture 
We're going to talk first about wastewater wetlands and then landscape restoration and then wef, uh, wetland buffer research that we did and then stormwater wetlands research. And then I'm going to tell you a little bit about EMAP and LDI and WCI and NWCA. And then if I have time, some miscellaneous wetlands related research. But first, none of this work would have been possible without the dedication of my students. And this is a, a list of uh, the master's thesis students and PhD students. There were um, quite a few non-masters uh, or non-thesis students that I also um, uh, uh, mentored, but they are not in this list. I've been very fortunate to work with so, so many um, talented uh, individuals and great. So wastewater wetlands, um, the first, project uh, funded uh, for the Center for Wetlands. It was soon after HT arrived, uh, and it was funded by the National Science Foundation and the Rockefeller Foundation. Um, and it was uh, for Cypress Wetlands for Water Management, Recycling, and Conservation. It turned out to be about a, an eight-year project. Uh, it was a five-year project and then three years of extensions that um, funded any number of graduate students, including myself. And the whole idea was to test the, the concept of using cypress domes um, and other wetlands in Florida for the recycle of treated wastewater. It was a, a technology that had never been tried before um, officially. Odom had done some work in uh, Chapel Hill uh, before he left uh, North Carolina to come to Florida. So had had some inkling and some idea about it. Um, <clears throat> that led, so during that time, I was a graduate student um, and I was just a grunt. I, I was doing field work, uh, collecting data um, on the, on the uh, wetlands project. And then once I received my PhD, I got in, involved in treatment wetlands from the uh, perspective of uh, designing them. And the first thing, that I did was to develop a simulation model that we could use to size wetlands, um, these, these um, wastewater wetlands. And so this is a diagram of a simulation model and then th th this is the output from that. And I used that model then to design any number of wetland systems throughout the state. Uh, these are examples of wetlands that never got built, or, 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 or treatment wetlands that never got built. Uh, we designed a system in Sarasota County uh, that was on a big branch called the High Hout Branch. And then they had real problems with landfill leachate in Sarasota County, so we designed a wetland there. And both of those, um, instead of building the wetlands, the, um, the uh, legislators from that um, uh, county were able to get the um, legislature to give them an exemption for discharge of treated effluent to Sarasota Bay. And so they never had to build these, uh, these wetlands. And then I designed a really interesting wet, uh, wastewater slough uh, in South Dade County. These are the old finger glades, they called them, which was um, uh, the, the Everglades is out here. And these were when the wetland uh, water filled up the Everglades during the rainy season back in the day. Um, they would, it would flow out through these finger glades into Biscayne Bay. Um, there was some 30 million gallons of treated effluent in Dade County that was being um, uh, discharged into the uh, boulder zone in the aquifers below Miami and also discharged directly to Biscayne Bay. And my thought was, why not use that water uh, to develop, uh, redevelop these wetland sloughs um, and uh, create, you know, a habitat. Um, Dade County didn't um, like that uh, idea all too much. But some successful restoration projects. The first was uh, Lake Apopka. Uh, uh, Lake Apopka had a real problem back in the day. And the only way that they could see to clean it up, you can't build a sewage treatment plant and do it, um, was to develop a, a flow through marsh system, which I designed and the water would flow in through this marsh, flow through it, and then flow back out um, cleaner than it came in. And um, that's been working now for um, 20, 30 years. And then <clears throat> the redevelopment of the uh, flowway, the Ocklawaha, the Ocklawaha River was channelized. Um, <clears throat> and this hill area right through here um, was, um, a farm which was bought by the water management district and then we tried to restore 
the old flow of the, of the river back through that old agricultural land. And then probably the biggest and most successful of my projects, uh, design projects, excuse me, um, was the Iron Bridge Treatment Wetland. Uh, we designed the uh, conceptual design for that um, back in the um, <clears throat> early uh, mid 1990s. Uh, this at, a, at the time that it was constructed, it was the largest uh, treatment wetland in the world. Um, I think now there may be some bigger ones. So <clears throat> all of those years, uh, we worked uh, for designing these treatment systems and uh, educating students, of course. And then they went out into the world and, and started working in, in uh, uh, engineering firms and so forth. And they sort of took over that whole realm. Um, and the, United, the University of Florida doesn't want to compete with its graduate students. So uh, I pretty much stopped doing um, uh, uh, treatment wetland design and so forth and left that up to uh, the, the uh, consulting firms and, and, my former, and many of my former students. Um, during this same time and, and continuing on past it, uh, we got involved in landscape restoration and primarily um, uh, from phosphate mining. And here again, we had this co-evolution. It was the co-evolution of science, industry, and regulation. And what you see here is a, is a phosphate mine drag line um, and phosphate mining is a, uh, a mining, a surface mining, uh, open pit mining. And the matrix of the, uh, of the uh, phosphate is about 10 meters below the surface. So phosphate mining began in Florida in the late 1900s. So like, I think the first mine was in, in uh, uh, 19, uh, I'm sorry, 1800s, uh, in the late 1800s. And the first one was about 1888. But beginning in 1975 and continuing to today, phosphate miners are required to reclaim lands. So prior to 1975, there was no regulation whatsoever um, <clears throat> uh, on these mines. And the first reclamation consisted of hiding the effects of mining and how we got to the place where we started actually um, uh, regulating um, and asking for reclamation was because the story goes that the then governor of the state of Florida flew over one of these mines in his airplane heading on his way back to Tallahassee to the state capitol, looked down and saw this huge expanse of what looked like a moonscape and says, we've got to do something about that. And so thus began the state's interest in regulating the reclamation. Um, and the idea was just to hide it, uh, to make it go away. So that meant um, recontouring where you could and planting uh, grass vegetation to cover it. And, and so the, the initial regulations, the initial reclamation was just um, recontouring and making pasture with a few trees. Um, and then, so that was, <clears throat> Revegetation, re revegetation, and then at about 1984, um, the state got more interested in doing something other than just um, planting grass and making pasture, and they uh, eventually said that you have to return wetlands to their pre-mining type, nature, function, and acreage, and that, of course, is after. Uh, the uh, major increase in the interest by, by society in, in wetlands and in their wetland uh, uh, values. <clears throat> and so um, the first project that I did was in 1982, soon after getting my PhD, and it was um, studying uh, the use of muck or the organic matter from um, a wetland that was going to be mined um, and using that as an inoculant for constructed wetlands. So now it's a pretty, uh, it's used quite frequently. I mean, it's a pretty common practice, but back in the day, um, it was, this was the first test of, of that idea. And of course, the take home message from that project was that the wetland organic matter, that muck contains a significant quantity of viable seeds and propagules and can be used to jumpstart restoration and creation. <clears throat> so what you see over here is, uh, these are sites that are not inoculated, 
and there are no wetland species whatsoever on them, even though they had the right hydrology. And these are uh, different quantities and amounts of, of inoculum. And so you can see that uh, the more um, uh, uh, muck that we put on them, um, the more uh, wetland uh, species we got. <clears throat> Following that, in, in 1984, the thing that I realized um, in that first study, after we did the, the muck analysis, uh, the muck application, was that we had a bunch of people, um, engineers, mining engineers, who were trying to reclaim ecosystems, <clears throat> not just wetlands, but uplands as well, but um, uh, in combinations of wetland and upland, you know, uh, landscapes of wetlands and uplands. And uh, many of them probably never even had a biology um, a degree uh, a course, much less <clears throat> an ecology course. So they had no idea. Um, and the first thing they did was says, well, we just plant trees. You know, we plant wetland trees. So we're going to plant cypress trees everywhere. And so our thought was what we needed to do was to give them a cookbook. So if you want to create a cypress wetland, this is, are the necessary ingredients. It's just like if you're gonna make a pancake, what are the necessary ingredients? So we studied the physical and biological characteristics of native Florida landscapes all over the state, um, the central and Northern part of the state. And we studied also nationally reclaimed landscapes, that is land, uh, agricultural lands that were abandoned and were naturally reclaiming themselves going through uh, succession. And the ultimate was to develop a handbook of restoration and construction techniques. So we collected and analyzed an unprecedented quantity of data on the structure and function of wetlands and the ecotones between wetland and upland systems. We developed 52 belted trans uh, transcripts throughout the state, totaling 23 kilometers in length. So an incredible amount of data. And we collected soils, we collected a strata, vegetation of all the strata. Um, we collected, uh, we put in wells and, and kept uh, records for three years of the, of the hydrology of these sites so that we could eventually say, what's the characteristics of different uh, ecosystem types of flora? And so we produced this manual, a reclamation, a reclamation manual for phosphate mine lands. Um, and, uh, we took transects and did soil boring so we could look at the, the, uh, the characteristics of the organic soils within them. And we got some very interesting results. You know, this shows you the underside, the underneath, uh, this is the uh, below the, the hatching area is the mineral sands. And this is all organic. Um, uh, soils, the uh, muck of the cypress wetland. But one thing that I noticed, which became very important later on, was this idea that wetlands are not smooth, especially forested wetlands. They have a lot of what I called microtopographic relief. And you start thinking about that and you realize, well, if you have a, a water that, uh, level that varies in here, uh, through the wet season, dry season, you don't have just one hydro period in this wetland. You have multiple hydro periods and what I call hydro pattern, which I'll get back to in a little bit. The idea of depth and duration of flooding is not just because it's a flat surface. It has all of this uh, microtopographic relief, which increases the diversity of hydro pattern locations within the wetland and thus gives you an increase in diversity of species that can exist within it. Really important stuff. And so <clears throat> we also looked at different uh, wetland types and the range in centimeters. How much water does it go from zero to how deep? And we found that marshes for the most part are much deeper than cypress wetlands which are much deeper in turn than mixed hardwood swamps, which are much deeper uh, than bayhead. So this is all going towards trying to develop this reclamation manual. And looking at these uh, naturally reclaimed lands, we, we uh, amongst other things, just looked at the similarity index. These are two different similarity index that are jacquard and percent similar uh, <clears throat> uh, between agricultural lands and uh, mined lands. There were a lot of mine lands that were not reclaimed, that, uh, that uh, were mined prior to 1975. So we had a nice data set that we could look at. 
And <clears throat> what we found was is that uh, as we um, moved out, this is age classes, so zero to 16, 17 to 40, and then these very old sites, um, this percent similarity between the agricultural sites and the mine sites uh, seemed to be getting uh, more and more similar. Um, with the jacquard, it was about 50% similar, and, and with the uh, percent, uh, uh, percent uh, similarity, it was about 70% um, similar. So somewhere between 50 and 70%. Um, but that was back in the day when, they, when mining was in small scale. It wasn't large, as large as they're now mining. They're mining 5,000 acres a year in Florida for the most part, average. <clears throat> Back then they were little small things. And so there was a lot of natural land around them that could provide seed source. So once you got these huge mined landscapes, the seed sources were so far away that there was no way um, that they would um, get naturally reclaimed. And so now it required certainly uh, the intervention of humans and thus the need for a reclamation manual. And so we applied it. We did uh, any number of different uh, restorations of, of mine lands um, and most were fairly successful. At some point then uh, it was decided that we needed to sort of look um, at so about 20 years later, since they started reclaiming in, two, in 1975, how successful were, uh, were they? And what we found uh, was that the older sites were not as well developed as the younger sites. And that was primarily because the industry was evolving as our science generated new ecological technologies and new ways of, of, of restoring these landscapes. <clears throat> so they were getting better at it, which was really good. And that made me feel pretty good. And then um, in the uh, middle 1990s, um, the regulatory agencies got very concerned about what they called nuisance species. And those were cattail primarily, but also uh, primwell, primrose willow. And they started requiring the um, phosphate industry um, to uh, spray uh, or hand pull all these nuisance species, because they said, well, they must be competing with uh, the, the desirable species, the ones that we want in these ecosystems that we're making. <clears throat> and so the first thing I said was, well, you know, when these desirable species grow up, i.e. when the trees become uh, uh, a little bit taller, they're gonna shade out these uh, nuisance, so-called nuisance species. And so what we did was went out and constructed these uh, big platforms with shading uh, cloth on them over the top of uh, primrose willow and, uh, and typha, different amounts of shade. And sure enough, we showed that shade kills early successional species because they're early successional for the very fact that they are high sunlight, high nutrient species. And uh, once the sunlight is gone, um, they're gone too. Well, <clears throat> I started calling them pioneer species instead of, of uh, in nuisance species. The idea was they were pioneers. Uh, they were the first species in, they locked up nutrients, and then those nutrients were available for the more desirable species. And I tried to convince the uh, regulatory agencies of this, and we developed a simulation model, which showed that you got back uh, a much more, a healthier, more robust, uh, and more diverse uh, uh, ecosystem if you didn't go in there and continually spray these uh, pioneer species over the years. And uh, we tried to convince the, uh, the uh, regulatory agencies of that. We were somewhat successful, but not too. Then we also looked at uh, the successional development of forested wetlands on reclaimed phosphate mine lands without spraying. And the bottom, and this one was to look at the amount of nutrients in the in the ecosystem uh, in uh, areas that were sprayed versus areas that weren't uh, were not sprayed, and basically what we found was early successional Sorry, species. Could you say that again? My apologies. <laughs> early successional species. Um, are really good at sequestering nutrients and tying them up into the soil, and of course, then making them available for, um, uh, for the later, uh, more desirable species that come along. And then we got very interested in trajectories. Well, so 
we see that we're successful early on, but are these going to be successful ecosystems in the long run? Or are they gonna become somewhere um, um, ecologically stunted and not move through? So the concept of ecological trajectory says uh, that you've got um, some acceptable range starting with, with whatever quality you're measuring, uh, diversity or um, uh, uh, canopy height or canopy spread or whatever, um, there is some um, range that are, is acceptable range. Um, and, and there's maybe there's a measured parameter that you're looking at, um, but there's the actual parameter, but then there's an unrealistic uh, realm up here, which you're never gonna get to. And then there's a region of concern. And so we thought, well, if we start looking at sites, old versus new and, and along a, a, a chrono sequence, can we see some, um, some indicators that we could use to say, this is going to be a good uh, a good wetland ecosystem or a good cypress system or a uh, wetland or whatever. And so uh, studying everything that we could measure, we found out that the best predictor of long-term successional trajectory was soil organic matter. And that goes back again to those pioneer species. <clears throat> and then um, there was a major concern uh, by, by the state uh, and by environmental groups and by uh, uh, even the, the industry, that um, about 60% <clears throat> of the phosphate mined lands were going to be in clay settling areas. These are elevated areas of, of clays that are, are uh, dried out. And so there was a real concern that uh, is, can we develop any good ecosystem on them? And so we had a, a really nice five-year study to look at establishing uh, clay uh, wetlands on clay settling areas. I mean, the clays are okay for, uh, for, this, for the, uh, uh, the species that we're planting, uh, wetland species, uh, but it was really came down to the hydrology. What kind of a hydrology can you have on these clays? The, the clays are very different than the sandy soils of, of, of Florida. And so we developed a simulation model um, that could predict the hydro pattern, the hydro pattern on these systems. And, and the hydro pattern includes not only the duration, which is hydro period, which most people talk about, but also, also the depth of uh, inundation. So how long at certain depths, and that's what this is, uh, uh, graph is showing over here. And that was then became a tool that could be used by industry in order to understand where they could plant which species based on the depth and duration of, uh, of, of inundation. <clears throat> All right, so um, that kind of ended. My interest uh, moved on to other things, but in the interim, within this whole realm, there became a real interest in the state of Florida on wetlands buffers, on trying to protect wetlands and water bodies from upland development or uh, incompatible uses that, uh, that were adjacent to them. And so uh, the St. John's River Water Management District funded a, a study to look at the Wakaiva Basin and develop a, 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 a wetland uh, 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 buffer zone for, for the wetlands of the Wakaiva. And so we developed this uh, concept of three different things that you could use to determine the width of a buffer necessary to protect the wetlands and the water quality. One was how quickly sediment um, uh, falls out of uh, water, uh, surface water running through um, uh, this buffer. And the other one was how much of an impact would you have on a wetland by pulling water tables down in these adjacent lands? which is the way we develop much of Florida because water tables are high, pull those water tables down and then that reverses the direction of water flow and moves it out and drains the wetland as well. And then uh, Joe Schaefer, a, a faculty in, in um, the wildlife department uh, started looking at the spatial requirements of, of wildlife and, and what do we, how big of a buffer do we need to, to uh, satisfy the spatial requirements of, of wetland wildlife? Um, and so uh, the buffer widths done this way, and it was a quantitative method, 
and it varied between 75 feet and 300 feet, depending on the site-specific soil and groundwater conditions. And we also threw in there wetland quality. If the wetland was already a really low quality wetland, um, then the buffer may not need to be as big. That's controversial. Some people think all, any wetland is a good wetland. But. Um, <clears throat> so that was the beginning of it. And then we applied it to the Econ Apache River and then, then, and then to, to the Tomoka and Spruce Creek uh, uh, rivers as well. And these were just refinements and science backstopping for regulating of lands immediately adjacent to outstanding Florida waters. Now this was uplands that were that, that these uh, the St. John's River Water Management District and these local communities are trying to regulate development on. So very controversial. Uh, and they used these um, um, ordinance or these uh, studies that we had done as the method as the means for which to uh, to do that. <clears throat> controversial and as the um, the politics, uh, the environmental politics of Florida shifted. We saw much of this undone as as the um, polit um, as local communities and so and and even water management districts became um, more conservative in their outlooks. A lot of this work was uh, was undone. Okay, stormwater wetlands uh, from 1994 to 2012. Um, <clears throat> The passage of the Clean Water Act in 1972 provided a regulatory framework for addressing non-point source pollution. But it wasn't until 1992, 20 years later, that EPA actually began to enforce it through its newly minted TMDL program. And that was a result of a bunch of lawsuits that were brought against the EPA saying, you're not even um, uh, 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 um, enforcing your um, your uh, 1972 Clean Water Act. And so then they developed the TMDL program, which is uh, uh, total maximum daily loads. And then followed in 1999 in Florida with the passage of the Florida Watershed Restoration Act. So that took another seven years before Florida really got interested in um, uh, stormwater, non-point source uh, pollution. Uh, but our interest, interest began in 1994 with a study <clears throat> from, this, uh, from Dade County they had some real issues with uh, Southern Biscayne Bay, uh, uh, discharge coming out of the canals there uh, from agriculture and urban uh, lands um, was very high nutrients and it was having some serious effects. And so they were concerned that they were gonna get in trouble in 1995 because of the um, um, uh, DMDLs and so forth. And so um, with students, um, we developed this idea, a model, to look at trying to re, um, oops, sorry, <clears throat> to uh, an approach to stormwater management that mimicked natural watersheds rather than engineered conveyance systems. Big difference there. Uh, <clears throat> engineers think of moving wa uh, water off the land as uh, conveyance, get it off as fast as you can. Um, and natural watersheds are not organized that way at all. You know, the whole idea of what natural watershed is to hold the water as long as you can. <clears throat> and so is there a way of balancing that, mimic a natural watershed and provide excellent water quality improvement, and in addition, dampen the extreme fluctuations in stormwater discharges? I gotta keep track of time here. <clears throat> okay, so we developed this whole idea of a basin that inclor, inc incorporated these small wetland treatment systems. Those are the little wetland areas that are the, uh, developed at each development. And then a sub-basin, bigger treatment wetland where all of that water flowed into, and then a basin treatment wetland at the very bottom. This one controlled um, sediments. This one was really good at uptaking uh, phosphorus, and this one was really good at dampening the major fluctuations in stormwater discharges. So you bring that all together into a, a, a system, a, a landscape system of stormwater management. <clears throat> and that led to me uh, developing this uh, retrofitting an urban watershed in, in Dade County, the Arch Creek. Um, this, was, this is the Arch Creek area. And this was the old Arch Creek. I've overlaid it on top of all those houses. And our idea here was to um, buy up those houses and restore the old Arch Creek along with um, a lot of um, uh, parkland uh, for people to enjoy 
And um, <clears throat> uh, when we presented that to the Dade County, they just laughed at us. But that became the, uh, the impetus for many local communities to begin thinking about retrofitting uh, in our stormwater systems and putting in these stormwater parks and urban uh, parks that had a, a major stormwater component. Uh, I'm going to skip over that because we're running out of time. And then this all eventually culminated in work that we did for the city of Winter Haven, Winter Haven on sustainable water resource conceptual plan. <clears throat> Uh, and it was an integrated water uh, uh, water management system that ensured healthy lakes. All of these are lakes within uh, water, uh, uh, Winter Haven that were in serious uh, uh, ecological problem or heading that way. Um, and <clears throat> uh, sustainable water resources. So the idea was to hold the water as long as you could so it recharged through the sands and then into the, to the uh, 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 lakes. And therefore, um, it required the development of, of uh, er, a wetland uh, uh, stormwater systems throughout the urban fabric of uh, Winter Haven. But then we also said, you know, this is the headwaters of the Peace Creek, which is in real trouble. Base flow is gone to reestablish what I call the Emerald Nick Nicholas of uh, of uh, uh, Winter Haven and reestablish a flow pattern and, and flow wetland systems uh, that will eventually um, maintain the base flow uh, of the Peace River. <clears throat> They're working on that. I don't know how much farther they've gone on it since then. And then uh, EPA, um, our EMAP, LDI, WCI, and NWCA, these were all um, uh, um, things that, that came out of, primarily out of EPA. EMAP was the Environmental Monitoring Assessment Protocol. Landscape, LDI is my Landscape Development Intensity Index. And then the WCI is the Wetland Condition Index and the National Wetland Condition Assessment. So EPA was very interested in um, uh, trying to understand this idea of the human disturbance gradient and wetland condition. And so <clears throat> we received some money early on to look at um, uh, uh, evaluating created and restored wetlands. And this was, again, as I was doing this, I was looking at these wetlands that are within the urban fabric versus wetlands that are not. And I saw that there is definitely a, um, a change in the condition based on uh, the disturbance around them. And so what we needed was a human disturbance gradient. And so we developed that uh, with money from US EPA and from the uh, FDEP. Um, and this is this, um, uh, <laughs> I gotta keep moving. Uh, <clears throat> this idea of a, um, a um, uh, landscape development intensity index. And we had uh, wetland sites all over the state of Florida, um, 216 total and different in different um, intensities of development. And we developed the index, uh, the wetland intensity index to say how intense was that development, a quantitative measure, and then looked at the, uh, uh, the diatoms, the macrophytes and the macro invertebrates. Those were the uh, three uh, uh, stressor, uh, indicator species that we use, indicator, um, yeah. Um, and, Basically, it said that if it uh, if uh, if it was highly um, stressed, if it was in a very high disturbed area, then the indicators were very good at indicating whether uh, it was um, uh, stressed or not. And so, uh, after all, all is said and done, we developed the Florida Wetland Condition Index, um, <clears throat> and these are um, the WCI, the Florida Wetland Condition Index, which goes from zero to 100, and the LDI goes from uh, one to 10. And it shows you that reference wetlands all fall with, uh, in their condi wetland condition index all fall up here in, um, and in the very low LDI. Agriculture spans um, all of this, but still there's a nice strong correlation with as the LDI increases, as the intensity of development increases, um, the uh, WCI comes down. And then the urban areas are got uh, kind of scattershot. Um, and that's because a lot of them are new developments, old developments, and, and uh, many different things that make it difficult for that nice linear thing that we see in some of the others. 
And then uh, continuing to today, uh, uh, the Center for Wetlands uh, is participating in the National Wetland Condition Assessment of WCA. Okay, so very quickly, some couple of other things. Back in 1975, I led a group of students and we mapped um, the ecosystems and urban land uses of the South Florida Water Management District, starting with Disney World right up here at the top and the water flows down through and comes out the bottom. Uh, <clears throat> and this was the first map, a uh, uh, detailed map of the ecosystems and the change of the ecosystems. This is what it looked like before humans. This is what it looked like in the 1950s. And this is what it looked like in 1973. Uh, so that got my interest in trying to understand, again, this relationship between human development and, and the quality of, of urban systems. We developed the first uh, wetland ordinance, protection ordinance in the state of Florida um, uh, for Seminole County, uh, the local county here. Um, and the one thing I learned in that was we can't call it a protection ordinance. Um, I was working with a group of citizens from uh, uh, Seminole County, and they had to give it their blessing before it could go to the county commission. And I had this real resistance from the development community, from the bankers and the developers and so forth. Um, and since this was going into their development ordinance, we just called it a wetland development ordinance, and then everybody was happy, even though we didn't change the, the protection at all. But uh, once it got that name, it was easy for it to go through. So it was the first of the of, of many, I think, um, development ordinances or, or protection ordinances throughout the state. And I'm going to skip that one. And <clears throat> this one was really fun. Um, John Craig was a graduate student um, development of reflective. Uh, satellite imagery analysis, we were trying to under develop an algorithm using satellites that we could uh, pick out stressed wetlands. And we found that in band five, there was a significant difference in severely stressed wetlands and natural wetlands and could be used, satellite imagery could be used um, as a means of, uh, of predicting uh, the condition of, 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 uh, of wetlands. Pretty cool. And then uh, I think this is finally it. Uh, St. John's River Water Management District funded us to develop a floating island uh, uh, to treat phosphorus in, in situ uh, in, in the lake. Um, many of the lakes in Florida are now surrounded by uh, houses and there's land is, a, a, is a, at a premium, very expensive. So designing um, treatment wetlands for these uh, lakes is nearly impossible. So what about designing cool looking uh, uh, floating islands out there, not the kind that have vegetation floating in them because the treatment there is very, very minimal. But these are actually, they're uh, uh, solar powered pumps that pump water through the system. Um, and it's both a chemical and a biological treatment system. And <clears throat> so we found that using the 50th and the 90th percentiles of PO4 removal, and the footprint of the FIT system yielded efficiencies of between 56 and 86% uh, 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 of removal and an aerial P removal rate of a, between nine and 16 grams per meter square per year during the period of record, period record which is huge. I mean, most treatment wetlands do uh, one to two uh, grams per meter square per year. And because of the configuration of both a chemical precipitate and biology, we were able to really push that along. Maybe that'll become technology in the future. Okay. <clears throat> and all my research group has had the amazing opportunity to spend the last 40 years working in Florida, using science engineering to shape Florida's uh, future environment. It's been a co-evolutionary experience. We did science, we designed interventions, we increased the quality of Florida's environment, which in turn benefited Florida's economy. And I must say, it was a heck of a lot of fun. Thank you. <clears throat> Came close to 40 minutes. All right. I guess we have a minute or two anyway for, um, Questions? If there are any. Hey, Latoya. <laughs> Hi, I'm here. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, 
now we will we will take questions <laughs> hello oh. erica <laughs> how are you <laughs> do you have more to say than that <laughs> congratulations yeah I, I think I have I have a question that I'll um, start sure. off with, and and that's what what lessons have you learned from working with different people, agencies, private citizens, on doing this kind of work with treatment wetlands, constructed wetlands. All right. Um, well, as I mentioned, we had this. Um, this is not the treatment wetlands, but in working with this group of. Uh, of citizens from Seminole County, there was huge resistance to this um, wetland protection ordinance. And it was a mindset, you know, there were people on there that just said protection, wetlands, no, no kind of gonna do it. And I, in the middle of the night, I woke up and I said, but it's in a development ordinance. Let's just call it the wetland development ordinance. Um, <clears throat> and boom, it sailed right through that committee. Um, what I've learned in terms of treatment wetlands and uh, all, all of the work that we've been doing is that um, there is at first a resistance to change. So um, the agencies would um, look at our research, for instance, and they go, oh, you know, can't do that. And then slowly they would start thinking, okay, well, maybe we can do that. Maybe we can increase the, the regulation in that regard. And then the first thing that happened with the industry or with the, the communities at large was resist. Oh no, you're putting more regulation on us. It's terrible, you know, but then they get used to it and ah, it becomes a challenge. And they say, oh, how can we do this? Um, and maybe we are making things better. I mean, these miners, were becoming ecologists and they were proud of these wetlands that they were creating and <clears throat> the stuff that they were doing. So um, patience, I think, is what I learned. It's just, okay, just take it easy and you're gonna change your mind slowly over time. <laughs> so, <clears throat> uh, let's see, Jason, hey, Jason, uh, please type your, okay. Uh, Well-deserved recognition, okay. <clears throat> These are all people I know. <laughs> <laughs> cool, cool. <laughs> Thank you all very much for watching. <laughs> I was concerned. <laughs> I, I, I think you, I have an, I'll, I'll ask another question as people sure. think, think of questions, right? Audience members and type them in the Q&A. But a, another question, you, you were showing us um, some of these examples of, you know, early on in your career. And there was, I think, one wetland design you came up with that wasn't used. And then there was an, another one right after that that was huge and successful. Um, what do you at, attribute like these success stories to? What? Um, <clears throat> so the ones that were not built, uh, as I mentioned, the, um, the local community uh, was looking at the price tag of those. Mm -hmm. And they realized that they could just go back to the state legislature and get the legislature to give them a special exemption so they could just continue doing what they were doing. So boom, that was it. You know, they didn't have to spend the money. Whereas the Iron Bridge Treatment Wetland and these others, um, they, there was no way of getting out of it. They had to do something. They were um, under fire from both uh, FDEP and uh, the EPA and the Corps to do something with uh, the effluent that was coming out of the Iron Bridge uh, treatment system. And the only way they could figure out how to do it was to build this massive wetland. And it was very, very expensive. But now they're proud of it. They call it the, well, the uh, Orlando Wilderness Park. And people from all over the country go there uh, to work to watch birds because it's it's such a, a, a productive ecosystem. So <clears throat> I don't know if I answered your question. Yeah, I yeah. guess. I, yeah. Yeah. Uh, well, do you think there will be any near-term coevolution of policy to recognize function of successional non-native plant species in Florida wetlands and other aquatic environments? <clears throat> Non-natives, <laughs> that's a real uh, <laughs> touchy topic. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm hoping that the uh, agencies will stop their concerns over 
what they call the nuisance species. Um, and these are native species, but um, they're uh, ones that they don't like, you know. And as an ecologist, as a good ecologist, I look at species and I say, you know, they're there. That's, that's good, you know. And I have a, a stance about exotics um, that uh, doesn't agree with a lot of people. I, um, I'm not into uh, pulling things and, po and poisoning uh, the world, but instead allowing um, nature to self-organize. So um, I don't know, Erica. <laughs> Let's see. I just wanted to make the comment that Dr. Brown has had this incredible career that is really important. Uh, your students were challenged. Okay. Kelly Reese. Hi, Kelly. <laughs> Thank you very much for the comments. I, I want to say I, I agree with you um, about these nuisance species. I, I'm i early in my career also. Um, I'm in Springfield, Missouri. And here in the Ozarks, um, we've got a lot of these ponds, artificial ponds. Uh, they're just impoundments of springs. And um, the ponds tend to be quite eutrophic. And at different times of the year, they may be covered with duckweeds or they may be full with coontail. And I have a really hard time convincing landowners not to sure. spray the <clears throat> pond. Um, yeah. And so one of the things I told them, well, you know, if you get rid of these, the next problem you'll have is filamentous algae just, <laughs> and that's worse. <laughs> And we've seen that everywhere. I mean, not only in wetlands, but also in aquatic systems and in um, estuarine systems. They go around spraying for one thing, and then it just, I mean, nature bats last, you know, that's the old thing. No matter what you do, it, something else is going to come in that um, is doing what the thing that you got rid of was doing. So, so systems ecology is really important. And I, and uh, that was a little issue that I had with some of the regulators. They didn't have the ecology background. They had a great biology background, but not the ecology background. And so uh, they saw a nuisance species and said, ah, it must be competing with the one that I want because it's so prolific and it's so green. Let's get rid of that thing instead of, um, anyway. <clears throat> Well, we, at least we had a lot of my former students that uh, watched this. <laughs> Thank you all very much. <laughs> it's I, have, a I, have a, I have a question from Jacob. Jacob Diamond? Yeah. Hi, um, Jacob. Thank you, Dr. Brown. What do you see as the frontier for wetland science and its connection to policy? What are important ecological questions to answer? Ooh. <laughs> uh-huh. The frontier. That's a good question. You know, <clears throat> I think it. I um. I really think we uh, don't fully understand um, succession in wetlands, um, and we're still trying to uh, control uh, things that maybe um, don't need to be controlled. That we we're better off uh, stepping back and allowing. Uh, 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 self-organization to, to, and be proud of the self-organization rather than uh, um, trying to fight it. Um, but, you know, <clears throat> I've kind of left my, my wetlands career and moved on. And that, there's another lecture, maybe I'll give that one to this group one day. Um, that's this whole idea of the nature of value and the value of nature. Um, which is all around energy and, and, and that stuff. Um, and that's where almost all my research goes now. And that's my frontier. That's what I uh, keep looking at. Thanks for the, uh, for the question, Jacob. <clears throat> oh, looks like we have another question from Katie. The systems approach started by HT has always been of great interest to me. Can you talk a little bit more about its utility in terms of describing systems for which we may not have all of the data needed for traditional model empirical validation, but we can still explore system dynamics through this mathematical approach? Sure. So um, first thing about systems approach is that if you wanna understand something, you must look 
at the next larger system. In other words, what it's embedded in. You'll never understand a, um, a species without looking at the ecosystem with which it's embedded in. Um, or, and that goes for anything. So you always must look at the next larger system. Now, Odom used to say all the time, you, you cannot understand the complex. You have to aggregate the complex into um, these simple, uh, not simple, but um, what he called macroscopic mini models. The idea they're macroscopic in view, but they're small in scale so that you can understand what happens. And so they become models to test hypotheses about how systems behave and how they will behave uh, according to um, uh, some intervention or some interventions. Um, <clears throat> and so my uh, advice as uh, become systems thinker, become a system scientist, um, uh, always look to the larger system, learn how to diagram in any language you want, but be, be able to draw systems uh, so that you can see them. Uh, you can't just talk about them and you can't just write it. You have to see the system and um, uh, simulate using macroscopic mini models as a way of, of, of testing hypotheses. Um, for instance, uh, not too long ago, the state of Florida was really concerned about uh, nutrients in, um, um, <clears throat> in springs and they were changing, uh, the vegetation was changing and uh, they were sure that it was a result of nutrients. And so uh, they were trying to outlaw nutrients in, in, in springs. <laughs> uh, but I did a very simple uh, macroscopic mini model of uh, the dynamics of uh, uh, snails, algae, and salve, the su 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 uh, submerged aquatic vegetation, and nutrients, and water flow, and uh, oxygen levels. And it became very obvious in this model that it wasn't nutrients. You could increase the nutrient level and you still had save, uh, as long as the uh, snails were there to um, gobble up the, the uh, epiphytic algae as it was uh, uh, going. But as soon as you knocked out the scales, the epiphytic algae got uh, 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 as well established and then the sab began. So the model was a beautiful test of the hypothesis that it's not just not, uh, nutrients. Nutrients contribute, but it's also these other compounding effects, low uh, oxygen, the loss of, of, uh, of the uh, snails and also uh, low flow. Anyway, <clears throat> it's a long winded uh, answer to a, a complex question. Great, we have, um, we'll take one more question and then we'll okay. wrap up. Um, this is from Joanna. Um, hi, Dr. Brown, Joanna Riley Brown. Um, hi, Dr. Brown, question from someone without a wetland science background. What is your favorite wetland system in the, in the world, natural or human made or restored and why? <laughs> Well, my favorite wetland system in the whole world is the Okavanga Delta in Botswana. <laughs> and that's another part of my career that I didn't even talk about today. But I've spent um, <clears throat> six years every summer for about six weeks in the Okavanga Delta with a bunch of gra graduate students. Um, and um, I could just imagine that the Everglades was once like that minus the big fauna, <laughs> but um, an incredible, highly diverse, uh, low nutrient um, oligotrophic wetland uh, that just, uh, it's, it's incredible, it's amazing. And unfortunately, it's going the way of the Everglades, I think, as you know, more and more humans and, and more demands for water and whatnot. But that's my favorite. I'll go back there any day. <laughs> <laughs> Ah, the dog agrees. <laughs> Hi, Joanna. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think we're going to go ahead and wrap up. Great. It's been a pleasure. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. And thank you very much, everyone, Kelly especially, for the award. <laughs> it's, um, it means a lot. <laughs> it means a lot. Okay. All righty. Um, Michelle, are you still there?
All right. Don't forget. Okay. Take care. All everyone. right. So our next um, English SWS webinar speaker will be um, on January 21st, 2022, and will be presented by um, Julia Allard Tomlin, um, who I looked up, and I think she's also um, there is also interested in um, restoration of, 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 of ecosystems. Um, you can visit the SWS website, sws.org, or check out our social media channels to learn more and to register for upcoming webinars. Remember, our monthly webinars are usually held on the third Thursday of the month at 1 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And finally, um, be sure to, to subscribe or follow SWS social media channels um, like Facebook and Twitter to keep informed about and support the society. If you're not a member, please check out our webpage at SWS.org and find out how to become one and get all the benefits of membership in SWS. We also have a YouTube channel where all of our webinars are posted three months after their original broadcast with multilingual subtitles and newly added over the past year are our wetland interviews. We've got two in English and three in Spanish posted um, to our YouTube page. You can quickly link to those on the SWS website under the resources tab and select wetland interviews. If you're Spanish speaking or from the Latin American or Caribbean region, be certain to subscribe to the Latin American and Caribbean regions Facebook page at the link shown here. Thanks again um, to today's presenter, Dr. Mark Brown and congratulations on the Lifetime Achievement Award um, to our webinar sponsors. And don't forget that we're looking for two new sponsors for our 2022 webinar series. And thank you to you, our audience, for participating today. Have a wonderful day and stay well.